Thank you, Stuart. Oh. Take a seat, Glenn. Don't be nervous. It's going to be very, very not painful at all. So good morning, everyone. Lovely to have you all here. And it's my great pleasure to be able to take you on an exciting journey, a journey of exploration where we'll pilot a little bit of history of Energy Exemplar and get you to talk a bit more about yourself. Now, many of you may know the legend or the myth of Glenn Drayton, but we thought we would discover the man and that we would peel back some of the layers and we would start at the very beginning, which as I was always told, told is a very good place to start. So perhaps then, Glenn, you'd like to share a little bit about your background, what got you into the industry, what got you thinking about even beginning Plexos? Thank you, Helen. Yes, um, it's lovely little intimate chat, isn't it? It is just you very and me intimate. And you and everybody me. who pays our bills. <laughs> <laughs> so fire, no fire. pressure at all, is there? <laughs> <laughs> but look, this all started when I was uh, working on my PhD in operations research. And um, at the time, there were uh, developments in, it, in moving electricity markets to using linear programming for the dispatch engines. So um, what I was asked to work on was just uh, variations around uh, designs for um, electricity markets combined with ancillary services. And um, in doing that, I was looking at, um, firstly, LP-based markets, so I kind of wanted to be in that space. But secondly, I needed something that was very flexible because I needed to change the market design easily. I also wanted to do scenario analysis on quite small differences in, in these designs. So I needed a really accurate tool. I definitely needed optimization. Uh, and the optimization codes back then were, were um, well, they were, they were, they were you know, good, very, but they were just emerging and they were just command line sort of tools, um, quite difficult to use. and. Uh, it, it might shock you to know that I'm not actually a trained computer programmer. I've got a C plus in computer programming. <laughs> uh, I can defend that though, because <laughs> I never actually showed up to any of the lectures. I just went to the final exam and opened the textbook. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, not being a great programmer, I really wanted to build um, an engine that could connect to the LP solvers easily in a language that I could actually use, like Visual Basic or something. So that's what the kind of thing I started to do, and I built a, a, a simulation engine for electricity markets that I called WEMSIM, Wholesaler Electricity Market Simulator, that was based in Excel and connected through to uh, CPLEX to do the, the calculations. But that was really what birthed the whole, the whole um, thing. And then... Um, Having you know, gone out in the scary world of consulting um, and having to wear a suit every day to work uh, instead of jeans and t-shirt, I got exposure to um, the sort of standard commercial models at the time that were, were, you know, everyone was using around the world. And on one particular project, um, tight deadline, we we're looking at transmission upgrades actually in the Australian um, market. And I was looking at the results and I was going, this this just does not make sense. These prices just don't make sense. And so um, I emailed the uh, support team for that particular piece of software and eventually got about a three page long reply and I'm reading through this and they're talking about how they stack up generators here and then they go to this next point and they do that and they do this and I, I read it like five times and realized, oh, you can't do it, <laughs> right? So, um, so I sort of dusted off my old software and um, ran the simulations with that. And I was like, well, this makes sense. And, and um, very sneakily hardwired my own simulation results into the project's, <laughs> uh, into the project's results because um, that was the only way to make sense of it. And that sort of dawned on me then that I might have something interesting commercially and, uh, you know, sort of feeding that longing to go back to jeans and a T-shirt, I started my own company. Mm -hmm, just like that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So then from the inception, what, were some, what have been some of the challenges? Yeah, well, it was, it was obviously unproven software at that time, um, and LP technology was pretty slow. It was, it was, um, but it was accelerating quickly, quickly. You know, we've all seen how fast computers... Um, you know, have sped up, well, the old P codes were speeding up about the same rate, so things were really moving quickly, and also the sort of LP based markets were spreading around the world with, you know, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and, um, and early on we went to Ireland and Singapore. Um, but as you would well know, Helen, um, the hardest part really in terms of challenges was finding people, and, um, you know, I was in love with Adelaide's weather, and so that wasn't going to change. 
Um, and, uh, but it was, it was difficult to build a, you know, a critical mass of uh, operations research experts in, in, in Adelaide. So, um, so that really the, the, the approach uh, to solving that was to form partnerships with mm -hmm. consulting firms uh, around the world. And, and you know, Ross, as mentioned, he was an early partner that uh, was brave enough to take Plexos on and debug it for us. <laughs> uh, and then uh, also my uh, former um, university colleague, uh, Tuan, in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, started a consulting company and used the product. And that got us, that solved the, the people problem for me by basically outsourcing that problem to people, someone, else. someone who was better Good at people idea. management yeah. than I am. And, but we remained only a three or four person team for a very long time. So, um, but actually one just drop in there, the, the name Plexos for anyone who doesn't, uh, who hasn't heard the story, uh, it was just sort of a white, you know, you know myself on a whiteboard thinking um, what this thing does and, um, you know, I wanted optimization and, uh, and simulation in there because it's the optimization part of that that was unique at the time. You know, we were sort of competing against models that were, uh, I mean, almost like the 1960s version of AI, which is someone goes to a power station and says, how do you dispatch the power <laughs> you know, the units and wrote it down as a series of rules, you know? Um, and so I wanted those in there and I also wanted to emphasize uh, sort of the intricate network or the co-optimization of things. So I s picked the word plexus, which is a, a Greek word that has, has various meanings, but one of them is, a, is sort of an intricate network of things and then I substituted the US for OS uh, uh, for optimization and simulation. But um, yeah, so early days, very small team, um, you know, con consulting, consultants uh, using the product and, and doing the, the marketing and, and data management and support for us. And really um, early on, uh, even, even up to about you know, 2001, 2002, my office was the laundry at home, like literally. Um, a yeah, washing machine next to my desk, a couple of computers, uh, and, uh, and that was it, no air conditioning. But um, a big sort of breakthrough moment came when uh, I've, somewhere in, during the rinse cycle, um, someone from the US uh, rang up, and, uh, and it was Anna Givarges, who's not here today, but work, works for us, and she was uh, uh, working on a consulting project for the California ISO. And little did I know that uh, after the California energy crisis of 2000, the um, California and the, and the ISO were sort of persona non grata. You know, none of the consulting firms, but none of the big prestigious consulting firms or software firms in the US wanted to touch them. And so they were trawling around through their contacts and through the, you know, through the internet trying to find uh, another simulation package that could do the job and said, oh, you've got, you've got uh, transmission and you've got all this and you've got all that. And like, oh, do you th you know, can you customize your software? Yep, yep, can do all that. Yes, yes, yes. So got on a plane to yeah. California. And um, so that was a really transformative experience. I remember weeks and weeks of work of putting all of the California system data into the early version of Plexos, which was sitting on top of Access at the time. Um, huge excitement one day when we actually went to do the first simulation. So we were aiming to do annual simulations, you know, one day at a time. One of the things they loved about Plexus is it could do pump storage, so we were doing daily steps. Anyway, so we're all standing around the computer um, and uh, they hit go. And we're like, oh dear. <laughs> and we're sort of looking at the progress of day one, and Eric Toulson, who was working there at the time, turned to me and he said, well, I guess we're running in real time, about one day <laughs> for one day. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, over that course of that project, I learned a lot from them. We, we you know, got it running, I think, in an hour or so for a, a year. And actually, just to, today, it runs in about one minute, that model, for a year. So that's kind of the, the testament to the progress. And so... Um, you know, we had um, Ross and his team were doing sort of uh, Asia Pac area, um, South Africa, and we had uh, my friend Tuan doing Europe, and he was he was going gangbusters over there. With it, but we didn't really have an American partner. And funnily enough, the former owner of the software that I had previously used um, had sort of sold his business on, and then uh, in, in some ways wanted to get his team back together. Mm -hmm. uh, 
to um, do it all again. And he came to me and said, oh, look, that Plexos thing that you wrote, yeah, um, that's how we wanted to carry on doing our software, but we sort of ran out of time. So how about we become your US reseller? So that's how a company called Plexos Solutions started with some of the old team over there at Toulson and Tao Guo and Wing Zhong Huang. And I remember Mark, I'd, uh, um, those of you who don't know, I'm vegetarian or some pescatarian or somewhere in between, but uh, Mark took me to Chili's, which is a bit of a desert for vegetarians. But, uh, <laughs> and he said to me, look, I, you need to talk to Eric Toulson. He's the best sales guy in this industry um, and you need to convince him to, to come and be our guy uh, in, in North America, so I'm like, fine, yep. Uh, and so uh, Eric gave me a lift back to the airport and um, I'm sitting in there and his, uh, his people mover, I'm sitting on a, a broken seat with a broomstick holding the seat up because Eric's a, Eric is a Mormon and uh, he very generously, he and his wife very generously adopted four disabled children and this poor van had been beaten to death over his whole life. but. Um, he goes to me, oh, so Glenn, you want me to represent Plexos in North America? I'm like, yeah, yeah that'd be great, Eric. He goes, well, Glenn, you know I'm a Mormon and I, I've done my mission, so I'm used to rejection. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, so that was yes. That was yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so anyway, that, that's how we sort of got the initial start, mm -hmm. having resellers all around the place. And then, uh, you know, coming to the end of that first phase, uh, became obvious that we, we needed to bring a lot of that in-house, in do it all ourselves, all the support, all the data. Uh, and so we created Energy Exemplar, which is, was the, you know, sort of the global um, you know, brand name mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot about collaboration, a lot about networking, and some opp opportunistic phone calls as well. So and yeah, then totally. a willingness to get on a plane and head to another part of the world and to see where you could take it from there. That's it. So then if we look at where we are at the moment and think about industry tre trends within the, uh, that you can foresee, how you see Plexos adapting to those trends. What's your mm. thoughts around that? Well, I guess one little anecdote there is when I was doing, um, you know, what a lot of you guys do now, doing forecasting 20 years out, but back in the 90s, you know, we had no wind or solar in any scenario. Okay, so <laughs> that's why I sort of asked the question before about off-grid, what are the big disruptors here? You know, you can't, you, all, all your forecasts are wrong, sorry. They're all wrong, uh, <laughs> and it's really hard to predict the trends. But um, you know, I, I love sort of, uh, you know, we're very customer driven, and I love seeing what's going on with the software and the kind of questions that are being asked. And um, I think it's, there's huge value in in academic and research collaborations um, to see what those ideas are that are being explored all the time. I mean, at the moment, renewables, energy transition, hydrogen. You know, can hydrogen work? What role does it have? When does the economics become viable? Um, there's a clear need for better weather and, and load forecasting, distribution level modelling, you know, all these things are critical. Um, and, uh, you know, electrification of everything, electric vehicles. So those, those are all the kind of things that are going on now. And I, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I've got some crystal ball that says, you know, this is, these are going to be the great disruptors. But I love thinking about them. Mm. And I love thinking about what we should be doing with the software when, when those kind of things happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, trends, um, trends and, and um, where things are going. I think on the technology side, the big change for us now is, is um, cloud, the capability of cloud computing. And just to tell you another story, um, back in those early days in the US, um, we had a customer, and they're a very sophisticated American government customer. I won't name them because it's a bit embarrassing, but they... <laughs> they um, they said to me, oh, um, when, you know, can you, I had some support question, and it came out that when they went to run their simulations, they had to turn all the lights and air conditioning off in the, ro <laughs> in the roof that the Plexos computer was running on. I thought they were obviously asking about how much, you know, CPU it uses. And so they, this was, they were so infrastructure cons constrained that, that that was the situation they were running in. And so I think what we've seen recently now with the introduction of unlimited, essentially unlimited infrastructure is, is that move to cloud and the, how that opens up your ability to do so much more modeling, so much more um, sensitivities, which has been super timely when we're all dealing with uh, intermittent resources like renewables and so on. So that's been fantastic. I think the other part that's interesting is, is the AI and, um, um, 
Yeah, my, yeah, my take on AI is there's clearly, there's clearly an investment bubble going on and, um, and, that, and there's probably quite a lot of malinvestment going on in AI, but there are really interesting synergies between traditional simulation models like we're doing and, and AI. And when I showed, I think, last year something about how you could take the last month history in a market and then re-simulate it like 200 times. So you create 200 uh, versions of what just happened and then use that to train a model. Um, so I think there's, there's some interesting um, synergies there, but it does worry me how all that attention, um, it, it's very, it's, it's drawn resources away from things like um, development in better optimization codes, for instance. And, and that, so that kind of concerns me. I think there needs to be more development there. And it sort of takes me back to something that um, uh, a guy at, uh, in California said, Chris McLean, one day he, <clears throat> he said, oh, you know, I don't think people look at Glenn's software and they go, oh, you yeah, know, that's, that's a cool simulator. But one thing he's done is he's created this um, competition between the different solvers to, imp to up their game. It's like Plexus is the Formula One of, of solvers. You know, if you can solve LT plan right down to massive short-term stochastic models and so on, then you're probably a pretty decent uh, solver software. And so I'd love to see that carried on and fostered and, and you know, certainly not forgotten. And yeah, so. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in taking a turn. Mm -hmm. So um, yep. David Wilson took us through the history of Energy Exemplar and the sort of several, the, the investment history as well. I'd love to understand and could you share advice that you may have for entrepreneurs? Mm. Yeah, I'll flip a few cards okay. forward here then, <laughs> then Helen, because I've been waffling. <laughs> Keeping you on track. Oh, no, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's cool. Um, yeah, so advice for entrepreneurs. Well, I mean, the first advice is get a good lawyer. And I, <laughs> I, I don't mean because you, you know, being prepared to be sued. It's just that when you're starting your own business, it's too easy to do contracts on the back of an envelope. Um, and no one ever looks at a contract until the relationship goes wrong. And so um, you might think, oh, look, I trust this person now. We'll form, into, we'll form this relationship and we'll never look at that bit of paper. But inevitably, 10 years later, that, that now yellowed bit of paper comes out and you're fighting over some clause in there. So, yeah, that is a serious piece of advice, even though it's funny. Um, the next thing is, I think, is just to be confident in what you're doing and always honest with your customers. Um, you know, I've, I've always been happy to admit when... I can't do something, or it's not ready, or um, you know, but we're working on it. There's, there's no greater, you know, um, cachet than honesty with your customers. So that's important. Um, and, and again, don't sell yourself short. I mean, if you, you might admit that you're not there yet, but you, you, you can, you can create the capability to get there. And then I, I think the big one is um, to really dream big. You know, um, ask yourself, are your dreams big enough? And I get asked a lot, oh, did, did you think that energy example would get this big? And it's not that I thought it would get that big. It's just that at any time, you're always thinking, right, well, think five years' time we could be here. And then when you get to that five years, you go for the next dream. And you're always trying to expand your, your, your thinking. Um, and I think finally sort of, um, you know, just always be prepared to sort of reboot things. You know, if, if things are drifting and aren't working, uh, just like you would with software and you go, well, I might just like go to, we'll completely forget version one and we'll go to version two. You've got to be prepared to do that with mm -hmm. parts of your business as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. The other thing I'm interested in, you mentioned this earlier, was around sort of collaborations, partnerships, networking. How do you feel that that has played into the success of Energy Exemplar over the last 25 years? Oh, it, well, it got us off the ground, mm -hmm. right? You know, and um, this comes back to the previous question is, what can really help you is if you've got a golden customer that can get you started, someone who's prepared to work through the, that difficult initial year. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, we used um, our relationships with consultants to continue to develop the business. But I think some of the greatest collaborations are with our um, customers here and those who sort of sign up for, like, the technology partner program uh, and also our research partners, because they're the ones who've... Uh, especially the research partners, who've got the time to really poke into the corners of things and 
do the what if. What, what if it was possible to model you know, the transmission in this level of detail while doing this and all and that? And those are the ones that excite me. They're the ones that often land up on my desk and, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy working with those. And it gets you thinking about where the whole platform needs to move going forward, you know, maintaining that scalability. So, yeah. Mm, excellent, yeah. excellent. So, and I, I would imagine quite a few people are sitting here thinking, how on earth does he stay on top of what's emerging? Um, mm. You're the chief scientist for Energy Exemplar. Where, where do you go? How do you keep yourself abreast of industry trends? Yeah, there's this thing called YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Not just for music. <laughs> Not, Not just for music. <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I guess this mostly get feedback from customers, but I'm also really just generally fascinated in science and technology and how that plays into this energy transition or the energy system or the energy nexus that's going on. So everything is, all the energy systems are converging. Um, so it's fascinating to see how that, the pace of that technology going on. And again, I'm not going to sit here and you know predict what's what's happening. But um, for me, I'm always thinking, you know, no simulation is detailed enough. You know, unless we're sitting here going, you know, next 30 years, one minute resolution, a million scenarios, stochastic. You know, <laughs> unless, until we get to that point, we're not going to stop. And and so if you just you know, challenge yourself to think, well, what's the next, what's the next step in that? What, where do we, in five years, the model's going to be about four times the size of they are now. So, so let's try that and see what breaks and happens and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of, yeah, I just have a general interest in, in science and then also, you know, pushing myself through, through uh, interaction with our difficult uh, models and so on, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, we had Riverside mm -hmm. um, as the private equity investor. How did, in, within your experience, how has that partnership um, supported the success of the business? Yeah. Um, well, going back a little, uh, I was surprised, but even within the first year of starting my company, someone offered to buy it. And, um, you know, that went on over the years. Um, and, but... You know, you never, early on, you sort of never felt ready. And then the, the, the numbers start to get a little larger and you're sort of thinking, well, how, if someone's offering that amount of money for the business, there must be something here. And then you, you start to do some formal planning, which we do every day now, you know, on what our revenues are and our ARR and what the business value is mm -hmm. and so on. But back then, you, you, you know, when you're cutting software, you don't think of those things. But you start to think in a, in a more, uh, you know, corporatized fashion, I suppose. And so there was that period of winding up the reseller agreements and bringing everything under energy exemplar. And the next logical step was to say, let's set a target uh, for the value of this business and then what that means in terms of growth and, um, and you know, each value of each account and so on. So you start to break it down. And um, around 20, uh, 2011, I brought in a CEO uh, to try you know, because I am not a CEO. I am a software developer, <laughs> and I mean, I've tried all those roles, but that's that's not for me, you know. So I bought an external CEO in, and we, we started to do that sort of process of corporatizing, getting the business ready. But it took a long, long time um, to go from, um, you know, business that you've started yourself to something that can be sold uh, to, to private equity. And with Riverside, um, the attraction with them was their ability to access the kind of talent that I could not get myself. Um, the fact that they would then build, they would, they would hire CEO, David, and he would then build out that team with access to global resources. They had a US focus and the US was the, sort of the weakest area for us. So we immediately did a, an acquisition in, um, in, in the United States to, to bolster that area and then eventually we essentially moved our headquarters to the US. And also just that uh, Riverside really bought the dream. You know, um, Nick, who was sort of running the deal back then, like literally slept with the information memorandum for energy exemplar by his bedside. Mm. That, that was the level of commitment. So they were head and shoulders above, mm. above anyone else. Mm. Yeah. And sort of last question before I open it up to the um, questions from the floor. I suppose on a personal level, so you had a teenage business um, that uh, someone else came in and invested in. As, an, as a, an entrepreneur, as the owner of that business, how 
can you talk a little bit about what that's like to let go the personal response for you as yeah, well? Yeah, it was kind of it was natural for me. I wanted to keep working on the software, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like during that process of bringing of getting the business ready for Riverside. Uh, I had to go and basically, myself and David Llewellyn, sort of had to write our own, essentially our own ca accounting system to be able to pull all the statistics and things together. I'm like, this is just, this is not mm. productive use of our mm. time. So for me, it was just natural that whoever I got in, I had to trust them enough that I would just let my foot off all of that and let the experts do it. And I don't know why that's unusual, but I've been told it's unusual. But it allowed me then to just uh, free my mind a bit and be able to dream of what the software could do in the future. And, um, you know, and likewise, Riverside and, and David and his team have given me the freedom to do that. You know, they could have easily said, oh, Glenn, this is, this is what you do now. But it was basically, it was more like, you know, I was, I was able to just gallop free in the paddock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Look, and thank you. And so what I'd love to do now, if you're open to having people pose some questions, yeah, I'd well, love to yeah. open the questions up to the floor and see if there's anyone who would like to ask anything of, of Glenn. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask maybe a question when, uh, <coughs> when Riverside was um, acquiring uh, Energy Exemplar. Do you have... A uh, lot of compet. I mean, a lot of other companies were showing interest, and uh, was it tough to choose which which uh, which fund? And uh, well, that's it. I just mm -hmm. want to learn that. Yeah, uh, we had. Uh, yeah, like it's nothing compared to what you guys have just been through. But we had we had four players who were, you know, keen enough to sit down and go through the whole management presentation process. Uh, and three were strictly US based with no Australian connection. Um, and I was concerned about that, the cultural fit of that, of maybe being um, sort of, you know, not given enough freedom to grow. And Riverside, you know, really believed in the growth potential of the business. And they also have an office right here in Melbourne. And the, you know, that business is semi-autonomous from the US. So it seemed like the perfect combination of a cultural fit plus, you know, plus that US mm -hmm. firepower. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. lovely, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I think we have, excellent. Yeah, Glenn, clearly built on personal passion. How would you like to think of the purpose of your organization now? Uh, well, yeah, okay, if we just t strip away all the technicalities of power systems and all that, um, I'd like to think that I've helped bring the benefits of, of optimization out of, the, out of the cupboard and into the public you know, area, um, and ultimately I'd like to see these, these, uh, the, the power of those systems improving everyone's lives across every aspect of their life. And, and that's kind of ha happening naturally because it's slowly, you know, every, everyone consumes energy, obviously, but, you know, the whole energy system's being affected by this. So, uh, yeah, if that's, if that's the kind of legacy of this, that's what it is. Thank you. Glenn? Uh, Charles Darwin wrote a famous book, The Origin of Species. <laughs> I'm wondering oh. if you would write the origin of Plexus book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe your son right. or somebody that's watched you along the way would be more fit. So Matt's asking, Charles Darwin wrote the yeah. origin of the species. Are you going to write the origin of Plexus book? Oh, there is one. There's a few pages of one, but uh, yeah, it's pretty dull. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> You're looking for the inside story, are you, Matt? So, mm -hmm. Make one of those good podcasts that you listen to at night to go to sleep. To go to sleep. <laughs> uh, All right. We have another question. Hello, Glenn. Um, I'm curious, as a founder of um, Energy Exemplar and uh, being a successful company, what does Glenn Drayton do on um, a weekend, you know, off? Um, from the office or from simulation. Okay, thanks, yeah. Um, apart from walking the dog on the beach, uh, I like to run and uh, got some interest in motorsports and go and do a bit of mucking around on the track. But And uh, I've got a fairly large family of uh, D and I have seven children between us, so there's no shortage of things to do outside of, <laughs> out of work, yeah. 
You've also got what you're doing in terms of the land that you've bought as well. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm. We, bought, um, we bought some land uh, to uh, and started a rehabilitation project on an 1100 acre property mm. in South Australia. So that's uh, another way of kind of giving back to the community there. Yeah. Another question. We're getting a lot of questions, which is excellent. Uh, my name is Takuro Kobashi from Japan, and uh, I think uh, Proxes Proxos helped uh, global decarbonisation, and uh, uh, it's come with uh, uh, you know, the, uh, rapid decarbonisation. And uh, what do you think the most important thing to fasten even fa even uh, faster uh, towards future uh, to decarbonise? Uh, more particularly, maybe Asian countries. Half missed that. Sorry. So, yeah, in terms of decarbonisation, so uh, decarbonisation. Yep. Yeah. So, that, uh, this uh, plexus have been played very important role you know, yeah. to decarbonise globally. And what would be the um, uh, important role, uh, important uh, factors to even f uh, make it faster to decarbonise uh, global uh, energy systems? So from, Plexo, from a Plexos perspective, how can it support that fast growth towards a decarbonisation mm. future in, in Asia? Yeah, um, what I'm trying to do is, is make sure that you can model everything that you need to be able to model uh, in, in terms of emerging technologies that support decarbonisation and not just within electricity, but obviously within other systems, the gas systems, the hydrogen, um, and you know emerging storage technologies. So we want to be kind of the you know the grease the, the thing that greases the wheels of of of, um, of the decarbonisation uh, effort. You know, if, if you've got better modelling, um, a more comprehensive modelling, then that you get this virtuous cycle of being able to correctly value, assess, and value new technologies quickly and that leads to more innovation and ultimately a, you know, a faster path to decarbonisation. I hope that answers your question. Another one, lovely. <laughs> should, have, should have just done all questions. Um, Jack from Imidrola. Um, from your experience in market modelling, what do you think is some of the biggest mistakes people make or what do you think could be the most impactful thing people could improve in their approaches? Yeah, that's that's a simple one. Um, the the most common mistake is to go for complexity first, all right? So uh, you know, if it works for one generator, right, it's probably going to work for fifty. So don't put you know, if you're trying out some new feature, just take things a piece at a time. And um, you know, I, I often see you know rampant enthusiasm putting in a, the entire system in and massive time frame a huge resolution every option turned on uh, like it's a wish list of what that you want to do but you just take baby steps and understand the, the changes along the way Good have another question yeah, um, yeah Glenn thanks very much for your huge contribution to uh, to the industry globally now, it's really quite extraordinary what you've achieved and um, I honour you for your terrific effort. Um, I've got one question which is probably a short one. I assume that you worked round the clock early in your life to make this effective and I guess I'd, I'd like some insight uh, for the benefit of people here as to actually how hard did you work in those early years. Uh. And my, sec my second question <laughs> is, Plexos tends to rely on external solvers to solve the problem and it's pretty clear that sometimes they don't always do what you'd like them to do. Is it possible that any energy exemplar is going to take over the space of, of redefining these solvers to make them more effective yeah. for these really complex problems? Yeah, all right. Well, part one is I've worked more than a few lifetimes already, so I am tend to be an early starter and um, probably started from me having uh, twin boys when I was 26 years old. And so I volunteered to do the uh, anything after midnight, because I figured if, I, if you can get even two hours sleep before midnight, you're, I, you could do a full day. And so I'm like, if the kids wake up after midnight, I'll, I'll get up and take care of them. So I got used to a routine of get, getting up about three or four in the morning, 
and having one twin here and rocking the other one with a foot here and typing <laughs> on the keyboard. So, so I've, I've always been an early riser and I think you can get more done, say, from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. than most people get done from, uh, in, a, in a full day's work. So I usually, I'd come to work and I'd already done basically a full day's work of high concentration. So, yeah, hard. Uh, and I mean, I still do enjoy doing that in bursts now, but I, just, I don't have the same level of energy. But yeah, um, it's still the, my preferred work pattern. On the solvers, yeah, it's absolutely critical. We rely on those solvers. Um, and I think, you know, by creating that competition between the solvers, we we're in some ways driving uh, where they were going to a certain extent. Whether it makes sense for us to uh, actually directly um, you know, play in that space. I think is that's a question that's increasingly coming up. Um, so yeah, sort of watch the space, I suppose. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? All right. Oh. Yes, we do up the front. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, Pippa Williams. I'm I'm interested. Uh, with the rise of, you know, renewable energy and storage, um, you know, more and more we've got these kind of, you know, intratemporal decision making and, um, you know, uncertainty on the, you know, supply as well as the load. Um, do you think, you know, back, back to our previous conversation about simplicity versus collect, um, complexity, do you think that in making those sorts of decisions, um, the answer is necessarily going to have to be more complexity to, for example, you know, make a decision about, you know, one hour versus two hour batteries in, a, in an LT model? Or do you think that there are ways that we can kind of simplify that really significantly and, and, and kind of, you know, ways around that, that kind of natural tendency towards more detail? Um, well, it was something David mentioned, just the, uh, everything's about storage now, um, and I can't see any easy way around, around that. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is the world we play in now, Who, who's to say that there's not a disruptive technology where suddenly no one cares about storage anymore? You, I, I don't know, but for now I'm not sure if there's any simple way around modelling, you know, storages in a pretty detailed way. fairly personal question like you know it's a great journey that you had if not uh, you know the Glenn Trader and you are the founder and chief scientist what would you be if otherwise if you weren't if you weren't Glenn Drayton oh um, <laughs> when I was a kid I just I just really wished I was good at cricket <laughs> I used to dream of being like the world's best fast bowler, but yeah, that never happened. But yeah, if, if I could be anything else. That's what you would have been? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but, and on the academic side, what I really wanted to be when I was younger was uh, I wanted to design aircraft. So I used to sketch them out for hours when I was a kid. Uh, and then I thought that that was going to lead me into architecture. Um, but I got distracted when I went to a presentation on operations research and the, um, the professor who was, you know, trying to convince all these students to take it up uh, mentioned something about how OR was used to plan the protection of the convoys between Amer North America and mm. Britain during the war. And I'm like, I, I want that. I want to do that. That's why, that's a, I want that one. <laughs> I'm going to buy that. Yeah. Thank you. I have one final question. Mm. So we're, you and I are sitting down in 15 years' time right. and we're asking you what have you had achieved? What, where are you? Not from now till then? Or? No, <laughs> at that, in 15 years' time. I'm not sure. I mean, that's the beauty of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really sure. don't know. Mm. Yeah. And, though, and if you were to look back, anything you would sort of give your younger self in terms of advice? Oh. Um, yeah, probably lots. Um, <laughs> some of that's quite personal, I think. Um, From a business sense, maybe? Yeah, well, I, you know, the lessons I said there about being an entrepreneur and, um, you know, 
you, you, you need to be serious right up front. You know, you can't, I hope the comment about get a lawyer, that's, that's really just about, you know, if you're starting a business, get serious about it straight away. Every contract you do, every agreement you enter into, you know, you should treat it as if you're a billion dollar company and it's mm. a serious thing. But, mm. um, so we've made mistakes along the way like that. But um, yeah, otherwise I don't, I, I wouldn't say my uh, business career is, has a lot of regrets, to be honest. Mm, yeah. yeah, it's good. And look, um, thank you. Thank you for, for the sort of insight and the depth of response. And I know um, it's important to be able to share your journey. Really appreciate that. It is a great journey, um, a great story of success. And that is very much around collaboration and partnership. So uh, something to um, we'd all love to congratulate you on. Thank you all very much as well for your questions. It's great to see the level of interest. I'm sure at lunchtime you'll get more questions. But thank you, Glenn. Really enjoyed spending the time with you and going on a little bit of a journey this, uh, well, this morning. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.